Hello friends, Pastor Brinson here. First, I wanna just thank you for tuning in to this week's message. I think technology is so amazing. Whether you're downloading or streaming this message, I pray that it blesses you. And if you want any more information, or you want to consider donating to our ministry to help resources at Journey Church, go and log on to journeychurch.org. Now, get ready, get your notes ready, get your coffee ready, and get stirred up for the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this week's message. It's time. God bless you guys. My name's Eric, if we've not met. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Sorry to break up your fellowship, your koinonia, the word we're learning today that we started to talk about. Uh, before we get into the message, just a couple of announcements. I talked about groups fair. Um, I have two groups that I'm participating in and I have the mic, so I get to talk about them for a second. Um, the first one is a preparedness small group. We did not plan this with the hurricane, but effectively we're gonna be talking about current events in light of God's word. We're gonna talk about things like, should Christians live a life of preparedness? Are there things that we can do uh, to weather the storms of life, not just a physical storm like we've experienced Experience, but be it a financial storm, you name it, um, kind of bringing the doomsday preppers out of the doomsday world and having a Christian view on modern day preparedness. So I'll be in the back. I'd love to meet you. Uh, we're going to be meeting on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. And uh, I'd love to talk to you about the group if that's something that interests you. Also on Friday nights, we're kicking off our drug and alcohol addiction recovery group. It's going to be at 7 p.m. on Friday nights. So if you know people who are struggling or you yourself are struggling, I would highly encourage you to get them there Friday night at 7 p.m. It's called the Freedom Group. We do have child care. So if child care is an issue, there will be child care for that particular evening. It is primarily for people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol or their families or loved ones. So you might be with someone who is struggling from drug addiction or alcoholism. The group is going to kind of meet together and then split when it comes to the discussion time. So if you are a person who's struggling or know someone who does, first of all, get them there and then also come out and get some support, get some healing and get some freedom in the name of Jesus. Father, we come before you, we praise you, we give you glory. You are our king. We're here to worship you in the midst of the storm. We're here to worship you in good times. We're here to worship you in difficult times. You are the Lord of all creation. You're the lover of our souls. You're the one who saved us, delivered us, and sets us free. And today as we dive into this topic of koinonia, I pray that you use it to enlighten our hearts and ignite them towards you and towards one another. Father, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear exactly what you would speak to each of us today in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. So I'm going to weave a couple of the stories in with us today about uh, obviously what's gone on during the course of this week, but we brought up this topic when we last gathered called koinonia. It means this, Christian fellowship or communion with God or more commonly with fellow Christians. I think we received some incredible examples of that over this past week as brothers and sisters in Christ rose up not only in Journey Church, but in the church. And we were out there in the community making a difference. You could see it everywhere online. People were out there helping one another, caring for one another, loving for one another. They stopped being a fool on Facebook, even if it was for like 48 hours. I mean, they actually love one another and became the hands and feet of Jesus. The church beat FEMA to the punch. They were out there helping out families all around our community and doing what the church should do. That's part of the essence of koinonia, that loving one another and the power of the Holy Spirit that causes us to be selfless. Now, if you weren't here two weeks ago when we brought up the topic initially, we talked about relational circles. So if you want to be whole and you want to have healthy relationships, first and foremost, we got to have a healthy relationship with God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. God has to be the center of our life and the center of our affection. He loves us and we're called to love him. And out of that, all other healthy relationships flow, even unto yourself. So the first circle is unto God. The second circle is unto self. You need to love yourself in a healthy way. 
not in a 50 selfie kind of way, but in a healthy kind of way, right? We need to have a healthy understanding of who we are, what our character defects are. We need to work on those things. We need to love God. We need to have a healthy view of our identity in Christ Jesus, of knowing who we are in him. So if we have a healthy relationship with Christ, we have a healthy understanding of who we are, that can flow into our close family relationships, right? If your family relationships are out of whack, it could be that one of the first two of those circles is out of whack, right? So even beyond that, those kinds of things extend into our relationships with our friends and with our acquaintances. So that's what that last message was all about. So if you missed it, go on the app, go online, watch it, catch up and grow on your relationship with Jesus Christ. So this week we did get to witness some amazing attributes of Christ in Koinonia. I saw it online all throughout the week as people of Journey Church got outside of themselves and went out there into the community and helped people where they were at. I saw Cody on a canoe. I saw Mike and Jeff out there in canoes literally helping rescue people from communities that were completely flooded. I saw people abandoning their own um, you know, wants, needs, desires where, with no power, their own houses being affected going out there and making a difference. We have a couple pictures just from yesterday. Um, that was at Jennifer Pullen's house and uh, they had trees that were all over it. A number of people from Journey. I'm sure you've seen images like this. Go on to the next one. This is her house again, just going out there and man, look at the challenges that people are faced with. Go forward just one more. Um, at the same time, while we were out there, 19 of Journeys, people went out to the Clara White Mission and served the homeless in the midst of the storm. They were out there making a difference, giving out clothes. The heart of the people of Journey is just amazing. Go ahead, just one more. Um, even the kids, this is a beautiful story. Um, you, you may not know this, we have a group that meets on Thursday nights of young ladies. That It's called the American Heritage Girls. It's much like, say, a Girl Scout or Boy Scout troop, but a faith-based one. Maybe you're familiar with Awana. It's kind of in that same genre. And they called up and they said, Eric, we want to come out and serve. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, little eight-year-olds with chainsaws. This might not work out all that. <laughs> well you know uh, what do we do and then uh, I don't know who had the idea but they said what if they made lunch so these young girls over 30 of them ended up gathering together and they made over a hundred lunches for everybody who was out there serving it was absolutely cool to see they wrote little personal notes like Jesus loves you on them. All of them took the time to color on each of the baskets. And with great love, they went out through the city. They even took some to our sister church. We'll tell you a little bit about later. The Ville Church downtown uh, in Jacksonville, their pastor. Uh, the church got completely flooded out over two feet of water in the church. And his home got completely flooded out. And they went and spread some love up there to the volunteers who were working at the Ville also. And it was just a blessing to see them get out there. Everybody was serving from the youngest among us to the eldest among us it was awesome we may have just one more slide I'm not sure oh my gosh what is that that looks dangerous I mean they might make movies about something like that that was one of my uh, I think one of my favorite pictures of the day just seeing Brinson and other teams going out there we have one final one we went to the Rosado's house yesterday and uh, you know like many who were suffering from the flooding uh, you know, they really lost pretty much everything, but it was humbling to see the spirit of human beings empowered by God, being able to have the strength to endure through situations like that, and those who love them gathering around them to help them in their time of need. So um, all throughout the week, we saw images like that of the people of Journey Church. Give yourselves a huge, huge round of applause. That's what Koinonia is all about, loving on one another. So our life verse for this series is found in Psalms 34.3. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There's a corporate side of that maybe and an individual side of that that I want to discuss for just a second. It means partnership to me. When I hear that word together, Oh, let's magnify the name of the Lord together. So right now, as you heard Brinson um, talk about, we, we have a partnership class that's going on in the room down the hall. I won't be offended at all if you get up and walk out of your seat and go down there, but I truly believe with all my heart that every Christian needs to be a member of a church family. 
And if you've not been here or if you have been here for a long time and you haven't taken that next step of becoming a partner here, maybe you need to look for a different church. Sounds funny, right? That a church, a pastor would say, go, get, skedaddle, go. No, that's not what I mean fully. What I mean is I hope that when you come into a church that's called where you're called to, you would sense very early on that this is the place that I'm supposed to be that this is the place that God's planting me. This is the people that God is wanting me to do life with. He's called me here on purpose and for a reason. If you're visiting today, I hope that you walked through these doors and you felt like you were home. You said, yes, this is the place that I'm supposed to be, that the worship resonated with you, that the people welcomed you, that you feel like this is a place you could lay down roots because we all desperately need that. We need that kind of connectedness that comes in being a member of a church where there's a responsibility of the church to equip people to do the work of the ministry. Guess what? I cannot do all the work of the ministry. Now, I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. Ask anybody that was with us yesterday. Ask anybody who hangs around with us. I'll be the first one there and the last one at any event that we do. We're willing to get in there and get dirty, but I can't multiply that relationship to be able to reach all of Jacksonville. I can only reach the people that I can personally come into contact with. There's great power in this room if all of us are living a life on mission. If all of us are fired up to live for and serve Jesus with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, what an impact we can make on the community around us, right? There are people who are lost and hurting in every nook and cranny of this city. The only way that we can reach them is if each of us go out there and make a difference. So my primary job is to help us grow up, to equip us to do the work of the ministry, right? And then there's great benefits in partnership. We did a whole series on this earlier in the year where there's benefits like seeing people come out and help one another like we did this week. What a beautiful side benefit that is to being a partner in a church or a member of a church. So I can't stress that enough. If this isn't your calling to be a home church, find the place that is because it is there that you will be of maximum effectiveness. Does that make sense to you today? So personal aspect, relational, family, let us exalt your name together with your family. Now, I pray your life hasn't reverted to the place where your primary prayer together as a family is, oh, Jesus, would you bless this fried chicken and Krispy Kreme so it doesn't go to my hips in Jesus' name, right? Why y'all laughing? You know we do that sometimes, right? We slip back into that pattern, and yes, we remember Jesus in our families when it comes to um, time to eat, but do you know what? Jesus wants to be a member of your family. He wants to be at your dinner table. He wants to be hanging out with you. He wants to read with you. He wants to watch TV with you. He wants to hang out all throughout every aspect of your life. For some of us, that's petrifying. Come on, Jesus, right? But he wants to be there, he wants to be your friend, he wants to be your Lord, he wants to hang out with you. If you're struggling in your life and your relationship, maybe start to put him first and see what happens. See if miracles don't begin to manifest in your relationship once again. Start to pray with one another, do a devotion with one another, hang out with one another. God's sakes, go to a small group with one another. Come on Jesus, right? Get out there and begin to put him first and watch what he does. So God, self, family, friends, where do many of those friendships start? I think they start in two places, those God-breathed friendships. They start by serving and they start by getting involved in a small group. I'll tell you a couple stories of both. During our first service, there was a couple here who I had never really met. They just started coming to the church not long ago. Uh, His name's Mike. And Mike showed up in there and he was like an angel with a chainsaw. I mean, he showed up and he's like, I got this. We're going to go for this, right? And he he showed up and they came out to your house. You guys probably made friends with him too. Mike was amazing. Uh, You had to keep him off your roof as I understand it. You're like, don't go up there. I'm nervous for you. Um, Electrician and the tree surgeon. Come on, Jesus. Um, But there's another guy, Justin. They both come to first service this morning. And after, after um, they were there yesterday, I saw online, and there's a picture of these two guys that had never met, and they've got like the chainsaws crossed like this. 
And I have no doubt that God might have used that moment of them hanging out and serving. Who knows if God turns that into a lifelong friendship? How awesome is that? They had a great time out there trying to make a great difference at a great ministry, the end ministry. We love you guys. We know you're still struggling under the weight of the storm. Believe me, we're going to be there to help you and do what we can so that you can continue to reach those ladies who find themselves in distress. And, you know, through serving at at an event like that, lifelong relationships tend to begin and, and blossom. So if you're looking to connect, those are great places. Start to serve, plug in. We have many, many opportunities like that. Small groups are the other place where I think it really happens. I I think back to the first group. I was blessed to be a part of a church where when we got saved, they they had some must, like you got to do a couple things. You know, maybe we're a little too lax nowadays with church, but they said, okay, you got saved, you are going to go get baptized. And before we knew it, we were in Hollywood Hills, Uh, the, uh, the water out there in Hollywood Beach getting baptized. And they said, you will go to the foundations of the faith class. Because guess what? You guys are like 20 years old and you don't know anything and you haven't had a relationship with Jesus and we want to help you. So we showed up and we started going to foundations of the faith and we began to learn and we began to grow. And they said, you will go to a small group. So Mary, Jo, and I, with our kids, we end up walking in, babies in tow, to the Berlin's house, a group of Messianic believers, Jewish believers in Jesus Christ, and they welcomed us in. They were older in the faith. They were more mature. They had been around Christianity for a long time. They were doing their best to apply it in their life, and this young couple walks in that knows almost nothing, and they begin to sow into our lives. They began to love on us and care for us and tell us what it meant to be Christians and invited us to go to a marriage seminar very early on in our relationship. They began to point the way and show us how Christians should live. And then guess what? We've become lifelong friends. They've moved to North Carolina. We've got to see their kids have kids. We've got to see their kids get married and in the proper order. Come on, Jesus, right? They they went through these and they've been a witness for us and they still try to encourage us. In fact, last week they were online on the message that we did um, virtually when we weren't gathered together and Miss Gloria ended up watching that message online and she sends a text shortly thereafter and is like, man, I'm proud of you. You're doing great. So they're still encouraging us 25 years later from that first group that we walked in. Later, we had the blessing of leading a group in our early 20s called the Young Married Couples Group, which we don't qualify for anymore. Now we're the old (laughs) married couples group, but what a blessing that group was. We got to meet so many people and we're blessed here at Journey to have a number of iMarriage groups that kind of cater to that genre of young families that are here and we, we went and we started a group and God divined appointments. Like people would see it in the, the directory and we'd have people show up to our door that we never met before, that we didn't even know before, whom God would use to become great friends. And one of those friends was the Dubois family. And much like we're experiencing right now, there was a hurricane that had swept through South Florida and it really wasn't that damaging. It kind of knocked the power out and we did as maybe many of you did. You picked the house that you thought was the safest house and y'all went and huddled up in there during the hurricane. Did anybody do that? Anybody? Yeah, all right, a few of you. So we did that. We all huddled up at one of, one of the people's houses and they were all members of our small group. The power went out during that time. And then the next morning we began to return to our homes and the Dubois family lived about two blocks away from where we do and we saw fire trucks begin to go by and police cars begin to go by. And what had happened is when the power came back on, it ignited something in their kitchen and their kitchen ended up catching on fire and virtually burning down their entire house. So it was, it was a tragic time out of the midst of that. And, but the beauty of it was that through the relationships and friendships that we made, we instantly opened our home to them. And their family came in and we're a young family and they're a young family and we all began to hang out and we lived together for a couple months while their house was being rebuilt and while things were getting back on track. That's koinonia when you put two families together and they don't kill each other in Jesus' name, right? I mean, like they they came together and and we, we hung out and we made the best of a very bad situation, but through that group, through the relationships that we had established, You know, we had those friendships that were there that were birthed by God in church. And most of the people that were part of that small group went on to be in full-time ministry. It was really a divine set of appointments. And we were there for one another during that difficult time. God is good. If we're not part of a group, guess what? Those kinds of things are harder to come by, right? 
But when we are part of a group, God uses the good and the bad because not only have we been there for one another during those difficult times, we get to share in all the good stuff too. We get to see kids graduating. We get to see milestones achieved. We get to see, you know, the babies being born. And guess what? Some of that may not seem significant if you're a 20 something in this room, but guess what? You're gonna get old too. Come on, Jesus. It's gonna happen and there's beauty in it. And I think one of the values that we hold high at this church, if I take a minor sidebar for a second, I think of like our youth group. And many churches, if you go to the youth group, you gotta have, okay, any parents, if you're a parent, you're on lockdown, you're out there, the kids come into the group, you can't have the parents anywhere to be seen because if there's older people that are in there, then guess what, the kids aren't gonna come. But, you know, we have a little bit of a different philosophy, and Brinson's been able to pull this off beautifully, where many of the eldest among us in our church are actually here, even having presence on stage at times during the youth group to love on and care for and sow into the next generation. We need one another, right? We need one another. Those of us who are young, we need mentors. We live in a generation where mentors are lacking. We live in a generation of fatherlessness, right? We need one another. So whether you are older or younger in this place, we need one another to become mature in him. Can I get an amen? And thank you for letting me take that sidebar. So let me give you a couple of tangible next steps. Then I've got a little bit more scripture I want to share with you. And then we're going to go back there and get grouped. So If you don't have, there's some papers on the chairs or some papers that could be found at Next Steps that have many of our groups listed. There's about 50 small groups that are listed on your phones. Everybody's got a phone in here. I'm pretty sure of that. You could download the Journey Church app. When you download the Journey Church app, you could go to the group section and you can find all of the small groups. So I want to encourage you to plug in and get connected and not just sign up, but actually show up. There's a little bit of a difference. Don't be a heartbreaker and go back there and sign up for like 20 groups and then don't show up for none of them because those group leaders are going to be like, oh, they're coming to my group. And then you don't show up and they're going to feel all disappointed. Let's dive into God's word. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you a compare and contrast of a biblical church as found in the book of Acts and maybe a modern day parody that Brinson and I worked on together. Um, I promise not to wrap it. Any good parts are his, any bad parts are mine. So I'm gonna share with you a tale of two churches and then you help me decide what church you think you would like to go to. Are you guys okay with that? All right. Acts chapter two, starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, So that word fellowship there is the first use of the word koinonia in scripture. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." So that's the early church. That's the the ideal that every church should be going for as found in scripture. That's the the church that I hope everyone here would want to go to and be a part of and attend and be growing up in. So here's my modern day parody, not of a church in Jerusalem, but maybe somewhere here in Jacksonville. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to social media and were on their phones texting during the teaching. They stayed in contact on Facebook and took pictures of the food they were eating. They never came to Thursday night prayer or 9 a.m. prayer, so they never experienced the joy of seeing signs and wonders occur in their midst. When it came to finances, they were rarely tithed, so they had little to share. In fact, they didn't learn how to manage their finances God's way, so they found themselves in debt up to their ears and under constant financial pressure. Rather than owning up to it, they blamed the church and hopped from place to place, seeking out the next cool thing. Why are y'all being so quiet? This is supposed to be funny. (laughs) Even when they came to church, they did it sporadically and wondered why their kids weren't excited and people in the community complained about churches, their tax status, and their lack of impact rather than bestowing favor on them. They rarely, if ever, attended small groups and preferred gathering around televisions to watch grown men throw pigskin in the air rather than enjoying the communion of their fellows. Go Gators, come on Jesus. 
their neglect of God got so bad they continually debated with people online, yet turning more people away from the kingdom, and rather than seeing people get saved, the Lord cut their days and their people continued to perish. Right? And every stereotype and every parody, they're hints of truth, are there not? And some of them sting. And I think there, this is in some ways a modern day parody of the church in America today. I think we do lack power potentially because we're not doing some of the things that the early church did. But what could happen if we actually did what the Bible says when it comes to that? Why don't we break that down for just a minute before we go? Why don't we take one more look a little bit verse by verse about Acts chapter two. It says in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. It starts out with that word devoted. They devoted, they were all in, they plugged in, they became part of the body of Christ. They didn't live around the fringes. They went all in and dived deep in. They were in attendance in church when it was gathered together as you are today. You're here, I pray you're fired up about that. I pray that you value the gathering together of the saints. They probably didn't miss church unless they were on vacation or they were sick, they were plugged in. They knew that their presence mattered. They knew that the fellowship of the saints mattered. It goes on to say beyond that. So maybe if you use a modern day equivalent of that first set of verses where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which meant they devoted themselves to being in regular attendance as you guys have actually done here today in church. As you move it beyond fellowship to that word koinonia and to the breaking of bread, it meant here basically our modern day equivalent would probably be small groups. So they devoted themselves to gathering together in large corporate gatherings like we see today. And then they devoted themselves to hanging out with other people and breaking bread and taking communion and eating with one another and hanging out with one another and studying God's word together with one another. They didn't relegate that just to the Sunday morning experience. They gathered together on a regular basis outside of the walls of the church so that they could learn and grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a result, signs and wonders and miracles and amazing things began to happen. That's the kind of church I wanna be a part of. We get glimmers of it, we get glimpses of it. What would happen if we all were all in? What impact could that have on our city? How different might our city look? It said they devoted themselves to prayer as the third part of that particular sentence. I think prayerlessness plagues our generation. What would happen if instead of complaining about that job we hate to go to on Mondays, we started praying about the job and the door that God's gonna open up? What if we stop complaining online about those relationship statuses that we have and started praising God for bringing the right people into our life who he really wants to be there and shutting the doors on the people that he didn't? Every great move of God was preceded by a people who were willing to get sacrificial in their prayer life. So there's a personal component to that. Let's not be a church that just gathers together around the dinner table and prays, but a church that really would consider devoting ourselves to prayer. I'm pretty proud of our Thursday night prayer group. I, I'm, uh, and when I compare it to other churches that I've been a part of in the past, we generally get 150 people out here to come pray on a Thursday night. But what could happen if everybody devoted themselves to coming out and praying? How different might our church be? What fires of the Spirit of God would be ignited in our midst if we were to commit ourselves to something like that? How amazing might that be? Our 9 a.m. prayer group that we have, I know you guys are second service. Why can't we start one that starts at 11 a.m.? Come 15 minutes early and start to pray and see what God might do. I mean, there's 25 people that were back there pouring their hearts out, crying out, praying for you. They were interceding for you. They're interceding for your families. They're interceding for your relationships. They're interceding for the whole Irma situation. They're interceding for our city. They're praying and praising God and believing for great things to happen. What if you came and joined us? How amazing might that be if we had an army of prayer warriors there? How different might our city look? How transformational might that be in our own lives? Would you join us? Would you join us? Because when they did, verse 43 says, all came upon every soul and wonders or signs were being done through the apostles. I'm ready for signs and wonders to come back. Come on, Jesus. I've got glimpses of them, but I'm ready to see the fullness of it in our modern day culture. Verse 44, 
And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. The modern day equivalent would probably be they had a culture of generosity, so much so that it was miraculous. I think we get glimpses of that kind of culture when we experience things like we did this week with Irma, where people just go above and beyond. Do you have a generator? No, I need one. Whatever it might be, you could have it. Do you need this? You could have it. People go above and beyond in moments of crisis like that. You see the body of Christ really rise up. But what this was describing was something that was even beyond that. It wasn't just these crisis moments. It was all the time that people had need. Those needs were being met. It was an amazing, miraculous time. People who had means were sowing those means into others who didn't. Those who didn't have means, it said they even gave their last might, knowing that there's people even worse off than they were. There was this spirit of miraculous generosity that had been created in their midst that was incredible. I mean, you know, I, I think of just this week when we had it, our, our sister church, how important is it for all churches right now, the challenges that we're going to be faced with, you know, the Image Church or the Ville Church that's downtown, the pastor's completely flooded out his house, didn't even have clothes, right? No, no clothes, nothing. Everything got ruined that they had. The church is two feet deep in water. They're an inner city church that does not have very many means. The second he called up, I wrote a check from Journey for $2,500, which is a drop in the bucket for anything that they might have. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it's a drop in the bucket for the need that they're going to have, right? It, yes, it's praiseworthy, right? I want us to be a very generous church so that we can meet those kinds of needs with immediacy. Their need's probably going to be 20000 It's going to be well beyond probably what, say, we could do. It's going to take a number of churches to come together and be able to do that. But in this time, we do, I mean, I just want to, a couple things. I, I realize that right now, many of you are having to pay deductibles. Many of you are going to be financially challenged. Many of you have lost days at work. I'm not trying to heap additional burdens on anybody, guilt anybody into giving, nothing like that. I really, we're in it with you. I've got, I've got fenced down like you won't imagine. I got cows trying to run off. I mean, come on, Jesus. If anybody wants to come bring a horse or something, help me wrangle those things up. It'll be a good day this afternoon. But I mean, we... We're all in the midst of it, but I got word from, through Acts 29, other churches that are in our region in Florida, they, they couldn't gather last week, they couldn't gather this week, the, they depend on, maybe their congregations are not as savvy when it comes to digital giving, so they're really in a deep space, like how are they going to pay for that pastor, much less the repairs that they need. So this is a season where, frankly, I'm coming to you and saying, I need you to be extremely generous in the midst of your poverty to be extremely generous in the midst of these challenges. And we promise not to misuse those funds in any way. We promise to direct them towards the greatest need, either here in our own backyard, throughout our state, wherever that might be, because so many are suffering. The miracles that could happen through this are amazing. And if I were to have, I have many regrets in life and many areas to repent, but one area, if I were honest with you, that I think I need to repent before you is that I haven't talked about generosity enough as a church. That might sound weird, you know, but money is so tied with who we are as human beings. And the body of Christ is so suffering under the weight of, non, of not applying a biblical finance model. I mean, we, every, we're, we're just like the world so much so at times, like we barely have $400. And I'm not talking about how much you earn or not earn. If you live your finances God's way, you could be at peace no matter where that is in the spectrum of money. So I'm not talking about being rich or something like that here and some false thing. But we need an education on how to handle our finances God's way, not just educationally, but applicationally, Right? Because too many of us are up to our ears in debt and suffering under the weight of it that we don't even have the capacity to have the freedom to give. That's a tragedy that I need to have some responsibility for in our own congregation that, Lord, would we do a better job of helping equip you. And I've seen the reverse. There's people like the Martins who are here that are teaching, you know, financial classes with Dave Ramsey's classes and others. And it was beautiful. A young couple approached me in between the services and they're like, Thank you for sharing that. They said, we began to apply the principles that Dave Ramsey taught us from the word five years ago, and we live in a place of freedom. We don't make much money, but we live in a place of freedom, and we want to help others have that same freedom. That's what's described here in the Bible, not some weird, freaky, you're going to get rich scheme, 
But hey, God resources his people because they understand biblically what it means to be generous. And we use those resources to love and care for one another in good times and in bad. So that's part of what we want to do here at Journey Church. When all these miraculous things came together, verse 46 says, And day by day, attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with great gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. That's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. That's the kind of church who I believe we're headed towards becoming. Would you rise with me? And bow your heads and close your eyes today. I want to pray for some people and then I'm going to ask you to join me, not to run straight out these back exit doors and back to your cars, but to give me just five or ten minutes of your time to follow me through that door where JD's about to go through. So we're going to dismiss that way today. And you're going to have a cheering section when we dismiss that way today because I'd love for you to walk through our groups fair, to meet some of those different group leaders and potentially plug in. If you have to go, I completely understand it, but you're going to miss a divine opportunity for God to move in your life and connect you in Koinonia. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You know, we talked about where this whole thing starts. It starts with a healthy relationship with the God of the universe, none other than Jesus Christ, God's one and only begotten son. If you don't have that relationship, no other relationship's gonna fall into place. So I ask you today, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Have you ever surrendered your life to him and said, God, I'm putting you first. You are my Lord and my King. Will you forgive me? If you haven't, this is your opportunity to do just that. If you have, I guarantee you your salvation is secured. You can't get something taken away that was given to you as a free gift. But maybe you feel like you've drifted. Maybe you haven't been living for him the way that you know you should or the, know, the way that you wanted to. This moment's for you as well. So if today's a day where you know that you need to either dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ, I'd love to share that moment with you. I promise to do nothing to embarrass you, but I would like to shake hands with you. I'd like to hug you. I'd like to pray with you. So if that's you and you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ, nobody's looking around. Would you do me a favor? Just raise your hand up real high so I could see it. Is there anybody here today? Come on, Jesus. Is there anybody here today? A room full of believers. I see your hand in the back. Thank you, Lord. Are there others that I might not have seen already? Thank you, Lord. If you raised your hand, would you do me a favor? I know it might be a little scary, but would you run up here to the front? I'd love to join hands with you and pray with you. Come on, be bold. You got this. Thank you, Lord. If you didn't and wanted to, you're welcome to come right up here at the front as well. We'd love to pray with you. Journey, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Come on over. So happy for you. God bless you. Lord, we just come before you today with this sister as she's surrendering her life to you, Lord. We just together in our own hearts use this as a moment of rededication where we say, Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. And we wholly and fully devote ourselves to you this morning. We lay ourselves at your feet and we ask you to remove our sin. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to set us free to live a life on fire for you. Where we're a part of a great body of believers. We're a part of a great body of friends where we can experience the koinonia and the power of the Holy Spirit that only comes in a relationship with you. So we rejoice not only with this sister, but with everyone who's here. The kingdom of God is at hand and Lord, you are moving, would you continue to add to our numbers daily, those who are being saved in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. She's got a couple resources for you before you go back to your seat. God bless you, everybody. So here's what we're going to do. Don't go that way. Follow me this way. We got a cheering section. Let's go get grouped.